Welcome to Season 2 of the Changing Earth Podcast with Sarah F. Hathaway. Blending survival fiction and fact to bring you entertaining education that will help you dream, survive, and thrive. And now, here's your host, Sarah F. Hathaway. Hi, and welcome back to the Changing Earth Podcast. This is season two, episode three. Last week on the Changing Earth podcast in the Without Land story, Erica and her family arrived at the Luxor Casino in Las Vegas, which is quite a different place than the one we know now. Today, we're going to go ahead and hear how the meeting goes. And we all know that Vince had high hopes for this meeting, so let's see how it goes. But first, I have the honor to introduce you to a man that I met named Doug Hogan. Doug is the author of the Tyrant series, and he's also the author of a nonfiction book called Oath Takers, which is a call to action to all of those who have sworn the oath to the Constitution. He was a um, really interesting guy to meet, and I'm so happy we connected, so I can't wait to have Doug on the show. But... Before I get to introduce you to him, let's go ahead and get into the Without Land story. Without Land by Sarah F. Hathaway. Chapter 3. Once inside the former casino, they were met with the glory of a life long forgotten by most of the refugees. The tile gleamed brilliantly in the sun and the faces of Egyptian statues watched them approach. Some of the Egyptian facade that had themed the hotel in the past had been destroyed, but it only added to the authenticity of the place. Erica thought that the Egypt they had seen on television in the past had appeared to look pretty beat up as well. This place gets more and more incredible every time we're here. Daniel marveled at its wonders. He had never seen a television filled with the sights of Egypt, but he had read books about it after Erica had explained what the statues here represented in man's history. He was always awestruck in this place, though, and he had a good reason to be. It was like day and night compared to their life in the camp. Do you think we'll get thrown out again? He questioned innocently. No, not this time, Vince answered with a charming look at Erica. The light shined brightly through the huge glass windows and sparkled down on them as they walked to the designated area. Erica took note that everything was so clean, and she smelled the bleach that had been recently used thick in the air. They were always dirty now, and their house was always filled with dust. She wished she was in her tiny little home of the past. She had cursed cleaning back then. But now, she longed to live in such sanitary conditions. The family entered a familiar waiting room on the right side of the entryway. Here they waited in line with the other refugees. One by one, people left through a door on the far wall. Once inside, they would strip off their clothes and put them in a chute and walk through another door to a shower room. There they found sweet-smelling soaps, shampoos, and conditioner. Erica lingered in the hot water of the shower. She had always loved hot showers, and it was one of the main reasons she had agreed to come to these meetings at all anymore. Once through the shower room... They entered another area where they could fix their hair and men would shave their faces. There was no makeup for women, and many of the conversations of the refugee women revolved around that very topic. Erica thought it silly. She never really wore it before anyway. She had to admit, though, as she aged, she began to want some of those pretty things she used to dread wearing in her younger years. Their clothes would be in there as well. They magically appeared in a metal box on the wall that reminded Erica of the boxes they had at the doctor's office for your urine sample. The clothes would be clean and fresh, and Erica had to wonder what type of washing machines they had that could do the job so quickly. Once they had redressed, they would enter into another waiting room to wait for their case handler. Erica and Vince had had a much more extended residence at this place than most. They had not been the most cooperative detainees and were often overlooked in favor of more obedient families. This had kept them living here and earned them the privilege of having a nasty little guy named Matthew Tweed as their personal caseworker. 
He was the man in charge of the whole process here in Las Vegas. He oversaw the adopting out of refugees to the homes of landowners. To aid his reputation among the landowners as the premier place to get refugees from, he ensured that his refugees were docile and clean. They were just perfect to live under the rule of the landowner and not raise a fuss. The other refugee families in the waiting room were all called out one by one until Erica's family was the last one occupying the room. You know he does this on purpose, Mom, Dexter said in a voice thick with attitude. Don't start, Dex, and please don't get her all fired up, Vince said sternly, indicating Erica with his eyes. Who does what on purpose, Dad? Daniel asked, his naivety getting in the way of his comprehension. Dad, I just don't get why we have to do this again, Star chimed in. Star had been really quiet all day, and Erica had wondered what had been going on inside that head of hers. Because, Star, we have to get out of here. I don't see any other way to do that, do you? Vince snapped at her. Star leaned down in between her parrot's ears. We can always fight, she whispered. Not now, Star, Erica said under her breath. Erica knew that there were cameras everywhere, and any mention of rebellion did not earn you good things. Erica had firsthand knowledge of this. She had learned a long time ago how to operate below the radar. Vince rolled his eyes. His children were full of their mother's spirit, and he felt the whole day unraveling. Suddenly, the doorknob turned and the door opened. Alex Bingham walked through. Erica was still stunned by how much he looked like his brother, Andrew. Andrew Bingham had been the leader of the camp in Lotus, California, before California had become an ocean. When Erica and Vince had made the decision to leave California, Andrew had thought long and hard about leaving as well. In the end, he decided to stay. The people of that camp had looked to him for direction, and his great sense of duty had kept him there. He died along with all the rest of the souls that were lost when California was flooded that day. Hi, Alex. Erica was excited that he was here. Oh, hey, guys, he exclaimed. He wasn't surprised that this was the difficult family that he had been sent to retrieve. They sent you down for us, Vince asked sarcastically. Usually some office employee type person greeted you, not a soldier. Yep, I even brought my gun, Alex jested back, patting his sidearm that sat holstered at his hip. Oh, little Matthew is scared, Erica teased in a baby voice. Alex's appearance on the scene had lifted her mood. Vince glared at Erica, and she closed her mouth. Alex gave her a laughing look. Come on, guys. Alex turned, and they walked down a sterile hallway to a wooden door. He's in here. Just the adults are supposed to go in first. Alex opened the door to a well-lit room with a long conference table in the middle. Matthew sat on one side with a man, and there were five chairs on the other side. Please sit down, Matthew said politely, gesturing towards his chairs. His skull shined in the light through his thin brown hair. His beady eyes peered through his glasses straight at Erica. This is Terry Lawrence, Matthew continued as Vince and Erica sat down in their chairs. He is the owner of 20,000 acres of land by Minot in North Dakota. I thought of you specifically, Vince, when I got his request for a family. Matthew's gaze had shifted from Erica over to Vince. He is in need of a man to work on the management team and oversee the vegetable gardens. Now, I know the work you are doing here is with aquaponics, but I thought you would be a good match and that you would appreciate the opportunity. Well, that sounds interesting. I used to have family in Minnesota right on the North Dakota border, Vince responded positively. Terry spoke up. His heavy set jowls flapped. Erica's skin crawled as he spoke. His creepy vibe floated through the air, but Erica just sat there feeling out the situation. She had promised Vince she would play nice, and he was her most beloved thing in the world. They were soulmates, and there was nothing she wouldn't do for him, no matter how much she hated it. Vince and Terry discussed the land and farming details as Erica patiently sat there. Matthew had reaffixed his eyes on her while the two men talked. He watched her expression sour as she listened to their conversation. He was just waiting for her smart mouth to open and begin blabbing some freedom jargon. He was almost disappointed when she just sat there quietly with her hands folded so tight her fingers began to turn white. You two have boys as well, correct? I need a crew, not just a man, Terry asked Vince pointedly. 
His direct commenting on the boys and just one man rubbed Erica all wrong. She was no weakling. Aren't I part of the crew, she thought. Am I not sitting right here? She knew she could do more heavy lifting than either of those boys outside. Yes, we have two boys and a girl, plus my wife's mother, Vince replied, trying to test Terry's limits. He was not exactly getting the best vibe from this man either. He could feel Erica's energy swirling around next to him and knew she was probably biting her tongue off at this point. Well, let me see the kids. Terry was irritated at the introduction of the mother-in-law. Matthew signaled to Alex and he brought the kids in. Dex and Daniel came in first. But when Star entered the room, Terry's eyes practically ate her alive. His droopy jowls opened wide, and Erica thought that Matthew was going to have to scoop the man's jaw off the floor. The girl has been fixed, right? Terry asked immediately while his chubby hands rubbed together on the table. Of course, Matthew answered with pride. Almost insulted by the question, he said, all the refugees over the age of 13 are incapable of having children. Perfect, Terry replied, his dark eyes still fixed on Star and his fat fingers still mashing together on the table. What about this mother-in-law? It's bad enough I have to take your wife, but an old hag as well? I don't think so, Terry said abruptly, looking at Vince. Erica was so infuriated she could hardly contain herself. She gripped the arms of the chair until she thought they would snap right off. Her teeth ground together in her mouth and she stared at Matthew in complete outrage. Her promise to Vince was the only thing that kept her rage contained. Matthew stared back at her, almost taunting her to make a move. He could see her frustration ready to burst. Matthew, I can't believe you would waste my time with this jack-off, Vince said, horrified. He glared at Terry across the table. Nobody insults my wife or her mother, and nobody, he paused to draw the moment out. I mean, nobody looks at my daughter like that. Your time? Waste your time? Terry lashed out in hatred. You're just a refugee. What say do you have about your family? You refugees make me sick, sitting here eating the food I grow. Terry was now standing as well. His heavy set body shook with fury and his jowls flapped vigorously as he spat the words at Vince. Erica saw Alex's hand move to his pistol. She reached over and squeezed Vince's leg, knowing the landowner would not receive the business end of that gun. She had to calm her husband down. Okay, okay, Matthew was standing now as well. His expensive suit shimmered in the light. Vince, Erica, out, he commanded. Erica and Vince were all too happy to comply, and their kids were already out the door. They knew this drill all too well. Vince hugged his family close when they entered the waiting room that was on the way toward the refugee exit. Well, the meeting didn't really go as Vince had hoped it was. So you'll have to tune in next week to see the repercussions of his actions with this landowner. But in the meantime, I want to introduce you to Doug Hogan. He goes by L. Douglas Hogan, and he is the author of the Tyrant series. L. Douglas Hogan is a USMC veteran with over 20 years in public service. Among these are three years as an anti-tank infantryman, one year as a Marine Corps marksmanship instructor, 10 years as a part-time police officer, and 17 years working in state government doing security work and supervision. He is the best-selling author of Oath Takers, has authored four books in a series titled Tyrant, and is working on the sixth, a final book of the series. He has been married over 20 years, has two children, and is faithful to his church where he resides in Southern Illinois. So let's go ahead and welcome Doug to the show. Thanks very much for being here with us on the Changing Earth podcast. Doug, how are you doing today? I'm good. Sarah, how are you? I'm, I'm doing awesome. I'm fired up to talk to you. I'm honored to have made the connection. Um, you have a quite an extensive background. So before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about what was going on in the story today. 
So in this chapter, I've introduced this new system that our country has adopted in order to handle the lack of land and a lot more people. So refugees are housed at these camps until individuals who have land are in need of more workers. So it's kind of an adoption system. So in response to the nationwide disaster, the government set up these FEMA refugee climate camps to protect the stability of our country and house the refugees. So today, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what FEMA is and what they're about. So can you introduce yourself to the audience just to let them know a little bit about your background and where you're coming from on this issue? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Doug Hogan, and uh, I've served on every level of government from uh, municipal, being a police officer, working for the city, to uh, the sheriff's department, working as a deputy for the county level. Uh, I worked for the state of Illinois for 17, 18, almost 18 years, and I was in the Marine Corps for four years. Excellent. Thank you very much for your service to the country. I, I value your patriotic roots very much. Well, thank you. So currently, what is the role of FEMA within our government structure? FEMA is something that's set up back in the 1960s. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be a tool you know, designed to manage crisis in the event of a natural disaster. Okay. And natural disasters being like hurricanes, tornadoes, things like that. Um, and do economic problems factor into that as well? I think that they do, because if, if you go back and read the fine language of what, what FEMA does, it doesn't just uh, surround um, natural disasters. I think uh, it's, it, it could also include man-made disasters. So you're talking about an economic collapse, for example, which would be, definitely be a man-made disaster. Right, right, that they would step in to perform some kind of emergency function at that point. Correct. So what steps do FEMA take to handle these disasters, like – when things like Katrina happen, how what are the steps they go through? Uh, that's the question of the year because we don't really know um, unless you're like an insider. You're going to be privy to the, that kind of information when you work in for FEMA or with the small or larger uh, organizations that are working with FEMA. Uh, FEMA was integrated into the Department of Homeland Security like back in 2003. Before that, it was just like a separate entity into itself. Katrina was in like 2005, um, out to be a complete debacle. If you remember, we lost like 1,800 people. Um, when the state requested resources, the bureaucracy of federal government wanted charts and graphs. And anytime you got government, big government involved with these kind of situations, the smaller groups are going to be requesting the bigger groups for help, and the bigger groups are going to be wanting all kinds of uh, statistics and numbers. Essentially, there's there they're requesting more, more than FEMA's requesting more than the lower levels of government are requesting. Okay, so for the small companies trying to work with FEMA, it's like just a huge roadblock to try and get things done because of the amount of information they're requesting from you. Oh, tons of red tape. So if you got like a, if you got like a like a like a say you got a city disaster requesting for help, well they're going to petition it on you know to the county for help, and the county's going to petition on for the state for help, and the state's going to petition up you know to the federal government for help, and all these the people in the middle. I mean it, it, we're losing lots of time, right? And right. in the process, people are getting hurt, and the situation is growing worse. Right. So the it's just not very agile right now to be able to jump in where they're needed very quickly. No, and that's the thing. We don't use FEMA that often, and so there's not a lot of uh, time-tested uh, data for them to go off of to make to improve themselves, to make themselves better. Okay, that makes sense. So if we had a nationwide disaster, if they can't even handle like the little, you know, Katrina's thing, obviously it's not little, but if they're having a hard time with these localized disasters on a nationwide scale – it would be a mess. Exactly, because that's what's so mysterious about FEMA. Just saying the word FEMA, you know, it looks almost like an aura of conspiracy theory because you hear, you know, I write about them in my books, you know. Uh, here's how FEMA works. In a nutshell, you know, it's a city-sized disaster, for example. FEMA is going to defer that to the county level, like I was saying earlier. The county-sized situation will defer uh, to the state. And have you or anybody else, you know, ever seen a full-on FEMA response? No, that's because as of yet, um, everything has been has been smaller than a state sized crisis uh, like Katrina. You know that wasn't a state sized crisis. Um, but 
are there plans in place? I would answer yes, but I don't think FEMA plans out anything unless it's unless it's real big. Um, in the epilogue of my book, Tyrant the Rise, I have resources there listing several executive orders that take resources away from the American people, real life executive orders. Uh, why would such a list exist? Well, I mean, what's the purpose of possessing all the resources in, in the land of liberty, right? Because right. having a monopoly over the things that we have in our life become dependent upon, you know, uh, control. So FEMA is one of those mechanisms. On July 15th, 1996, Bill Clinton wrote an executive order that gives FEMA control over all government agencies except for the executive branch. So if you think Katrina's <laughs> a mess, wait until something much bigger happens. Yeah. And then they can just come in and take care of everything and take every, everything, any kind of stocks that would be available for the people to dole them out in appropriate rations or whatnot. Well, yeah, wishful thinking. I mean, yeah. that's that's what we hope, right, that the, the government's going to take care of us, right? But, uh, uh, you know, here's another executive order that was written uh, not long in 2012, you know, by uh, Barack Obama, that the executive can seize all water, all human and animal food, all transportation, all energy, all construction materials, all health resources, all farm equipment, all fertilizer, all fuels, etc. That's scary. That is and when scary. And FEMA, when FEMA's only entering to one person, what do we have there? You know, we have a, a, a dictatorship. That's true. And so now the plans are all in place in case that were to happen. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the biggest, the what I see the biggest threat would be that economic excuse. Oh, it's happening. It's happening all over the place. And, and the thing is that the, we're, we're living in it. And so we're graduating into it. It's happening ever so slowly that we're not even feeling um, the results. You know, there's not going to be a cataclysmic event until – until that one, that day when the, the stock exchange drops off the market and uh, sorry, your dollar's worth zero now. Right. And then you turn and then <laughs> the cities go crazy for one thing, because, you know, our food supplies are taking so long to get anywhere at that point. Right. Yeah, that, that would be the big excuse for to to go to a nationwide system like that. But as we've proved, it doesn't ever work having, you know, control over that many people. Uh, it's got to be a localized plan for your people to to be managed efficiently. And, and, and that's well, I, and you're right. I mean, that's FEMA always wants it to be handled at the lowest possible level. Right. Always. The only time they want to get involved whenever is whenever their resources aren't enough. Whenever but the localized the, the response team doesn't have enough resources. Exactly. But in the case of they're wanting uh, water and helicopters. What was FEMA asking for? They wanted they wanted bar graphs and things to show, you know, where, Why where the you problems need those were. things. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's sickening. Yeah, it is. Just well, let's make it happen first. There's actually an incident that happened um, near my house. I live in Northern California, so we're in wildfire country. And there was a wildfire that took place, and it was on um, both airport land and BLM land. So there was a huge debate between the responding fire departments over whose responsibility it was to fight this fire. Well, in the meantime, we lost, um, you know, I think up to 20 homes in this fire when they could have just put it out and then worried about, you know, where the who was going to fund that later. But the economics of the situation played in before saving people's homes, which was really sad. Yeah, you, you mentioned brew of land management, right? Did they, I mean, because they're militarized now. Maybe, maybe they had guns instead of uh, instead of uh, fire hoses. Yeah, <laughs> which is scary in itself right. as well. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I really wanted to just kind of, you know, bring to light the scariness that we put, um, how much control we put into FEMA's hands um, to be able to handle situations like that where, you know, in my fictional novel – um, I have the creation of these camps and whatnot because we've lost le land, so they need to house these people somewhere. So that's how they did that. But it's not really that far-fetched if you think mm -hmm. about the amount of control that we've actually put into their hands as of, as of late. All right. So if you had any, you know, really good uh, positives, like if you were in charge of how you could uh, – um, be able to respond to a nationwide emergency and how we could handle that while maintaining liberties. What are some steps? How could we solve this problem? Uh, all right. So we're talking like, uh, like, uh, 
at any industry, right? So that's kind of the premise of like my, my tyrant series, for example, what it runs on. There's not enough government help to bring about, you know, a nationwide response. Like you got, you know, with the, the massive flood and all that, where all this land is gone. FEMA is going to need aid from outside, yeah, you know, outside sources because there's not going to be enough within the shrinking borders of the United States, right? We're talking UN security forces and militarized uh, FEMA responders more than likely. In short, people are good. Um, they'll pitch in when they can, but I'm thinking long term, they're probably the people that are going to die first. I know that sounds grim, but people kill to stay alive in these kind of situations to save themselves and save their family. Mm-hmm. And that leaves the bad guys. And there will be, you know, a few exceptional good guys, uh, people that can, you know, survive in a, an apocalyptic America. But like I said, you know, uh, that would be the exception. Uh, you know, your 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 refugee camps are great, and I think existing the buildings that are shut down uh, because as strengths, so does the ability to pay for like federal uh, penitentiaries and state penitentiaries and, and things like this. Those things will probably be emptied out um, later on down the road, so those places could be used as like uh, emergency, you know, refugee places. Right. Or the the mysterious FEMA camps, which uh, I've not really seen pictures of yet, but supposedly exist somewhere. Right. Yeah, and that's always a back and forth debate over whether they actually exist or not. But so, well, I just um, you know, it it it's disappointing the um what we have set up and how they give centralized control, in my opinion. So that's why I was looking for, like, is there some kind of a solution that we could implement on more of a local level to be able to handle this kind of event in a responsible way if it were to befall us? Okay, so in the police world, we have what's called mutual aid. Say if the incident, uh, a, a horrible incident happens in Chicago. All right, Chicago in itself is not going to be able – Chicagoans are not going to be able to help themselves because that's where the disaster is. That's where the mutual aid is going to have to come in at. So local – Local governing have to pitch in and, to, and, and to help them. So they would have to take refugees from Chicago, for example, if if that's where their where their crisis was. Um, so to keep it localized, keep the federal government out of it. That's the best possible way is if that we help each other. So you got localized government that's still working; it's not shut down, and they're opening themselves up to take refugees in from other areas that was hit with a, a catastrophe or crisis of some sort. Okay, so that makes sense. So if we had um say, you know, a huge tidal wave on the coast of California, then Nevada would be helping us out, sending in extra law enforcement and taking people that were displaced from the coastline. Yes, that's mutual aid. And that's the best possible, in my opinion, that's uh, leaving it to the states to take care of, of our own is the best way. I This is just my opinion. I want the federal government to have as much as possible. I don't like big government. I like it small. I agree. I'm libertarian, and I believe that it's best handled on your level, on a very local level, because that's how you can, you know, pay attention to a smaller um, populace. It's just when you get too many people and too many people, it gets too hard to um, cater to everyone's beliefs and abilities and the structure they want to see. So I think it gets all muddled no matter what. Yeah, and if you don't like the state you live in, move somewhere else somewhere that has you know, similar beliefs. Exactly, exactly. And if you take that away, then it, it just um, – Yeah, it, what's the point of being American? I, thank you. Yep. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming and talking with us about this FEMA topic, and I can't wait to see you back on the show. Yeah, you got it. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug, for coming on the Changing Earth podcast. Um, I'm so happy we connected. Um, I look forward to um, a great friendship in the future. And can't wait to have you back on the show. Now let's go ahead and get into review time. It's time for review time. Got an opinion? I'd love to hear it. Go ahead and give me your two cents on Day After Disaster or the Changing Earth podcast. Head on over to Amazon or iTunes to give me your two cents. Today on review time, I have a four-star review and a five-star review. So not too, not too shabby. My first review is from Frank Nelson, and he says, Good story. One of my biggest, uh, the B word, about the dysotopian genre is there's no end to rape, torture, and graphic murder, but no sex. 
Miss Hathaway apparently knows it exists. It's not all it's not all there is to the book, but at least it's not ignored and fits in well with a good story. Enjoy it. So thank you very much, Frank. Um, you know, that it was obviously, you know, sexual relationships between partners are going to exist and it's going to exist forever. Um, it's a really important part of your relationship. It's one of the things that drives relationships apart the most. And um, so I'm going to have a whole episode this season on, um, you know, on how sex can help you reduce stress in your life. And, you know, it's always a touchy topic because there's always people that feel they don't want to talk about that or they don't want to read it or they don't want to really face it. But I always I'm a person who likes to face up to what's in front of us, you know, and it exists and it's there and it's real and it can be used as a tool and it can be used to hurt. And so that's why I really wanted to explore that topic. Um, But in this book, it's not as forefront as it was in the first book. I kind of toned it back a little and um, respected some of my readers' wishes as far as toning the scenes down a little bit. So um, I didn't need to make a young adult version of this book because it it is there, but it's not um, too graphic. So thanks very much, Frank, for your review. I really appreciate it. The next review that I have is from Jeanette Warnock. It's a five-star review, and she says, can't wait until the next book. Well, Jeanette, I'm working hard on it. Um, I'm hoping that it's going to be out within a year. Um, You know, it's always a process. I write everything by hand first, and then I take it to the computer. It's just the way my my brain flows. And then once I get it down, um, I have to go into editing, and I have to go into cover development and things like that. So it is a process, but I am working diligently trying to get it finished And, you know, I don't know if it's going to be book three is the end or if I'm going to need to push it to a book four, which I think I'm probably going to have to do because just like um, book two, the story is just really um, uh, appearing to me and I can't deny what's there. So I'm just going to keep writing, stay on my course and let the story unfold naturally. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the show today. I really enjoyed, um, you know, getting into some of the, the meat and potatoes of Without Land, um, introducing, you know, some more of the characters, and also introducing Doug to you. Um, L. Douglas Hogan, he writes some great books. I really want you to go out and check it out. So remember, until next time, dream, survive, thrive. Thank you for joining Sarah for this episode of the Changing Earth Podcast. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Day After Disaster, Without Land, The Walls of Freedom, and Battle for the South at www.authorsarahfhathaway.com. If you love Sarah's books and this podcast, please head over to Amazon or iTunes and let everyone know by leaving a review.